Hi everyone, welcome to Got Therapy. I'm Michael Baltimore here with Dr. Dan Rose. Uh, you know what this program is about. We talk about all things mental health and psychology, what goes on in the therapy sessions, and that's today. That's one of the things we're going to be doing. So we're going to look at the mind of the therapist. We'll talk a lot about the procedures and techniques and things that go on in therapy, but um, I've always found it fascinating that um, if you first go into the, the counseling for the first time, maybe you uh, kind of wonder what that's about and what is this therapist about. A lot of people have, for example, the, the medical model notion that you tell the therapist um, what's going on with you and they come back with things for you to do. And uh, however, that's not it. We're going to talk a little bit more about the process of therapy. Dan, how are you doing today? I am. I, I, I actually, uh, I, I don't like the medical model. I like the super model. Supermodel, <laughs> no, not that, that's the medical my, that's model. My, uh, actually, you know, I'm actually pretty good. Yeah. And I, at the I know we're, today we're talking about what goes inside the therapist's mind. But I just I want to throw something out here. Okay. If if you guys you could find this on the web, there you can live cam the world's oldest ham. I'm not making this up. There is a video camera that you can watch 24 seven of the world's oldest ham, and I, I believe it's about 500 years old. So there's a 500 year old ham that you can watch at any point in the day. In fact, if you can't sleep 2.30 in the morning, you can literally live cam this ham. Well, the, the ham's not really doing anything. There. Doesn't matter, it's just, it's just that's the world's oldest ham and you can look at it. You can see it. If in you want real to. time. Okay, the fact that it's still here after 500 years. 500 wonder, years, it's, not, um, that's, it's probably not very good. Or maybe it's like a wine. You wouldn't make a ham sandwich on that. You wouldn't want it. But I, I think what's great about this is that when I hear things like this, I can see how this is the pinnacle of civilization. That doesn't our, sound our, like it to Our me. forefathers and foremothers, all of history, all the death and destruction have led to this point, and I'm telling you it's worth it. If you can live cam the world's oldest ham, it's been worth it. It's going to be tough for me to pull out of this and transition to back <laughs> yeah, yeah, to the uh, about mind of the therapist, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, so, um, and I'll come back to that. That's a haunting thought for probably everybody yeah. watching at this point. We, Live we cam, the world's oldest cam. Uh, shake it, but uh, all right. So let's talk about counseling. We we wanted to talk about the first uh, part of counseling, the beginning of counseling. Uh, uh, a person with uh, uh, some issues, problems mm -hmm. in their lives, comes into uh, the therapist's office. So let's talk about that. What do you think happens? What's, what, what is the dynamic? I mean, it takes a lot of courage for a person to say, hey, I'm going to reach out and I'm going to talk to a professional about what's going on uh, in my world, and maybe they can give me some guidance, some help. So that's uh, it's kind of an interesting dynamic of, of a person getting to that point of um, making that first move mm -hmm. to come into therapy. Well, see, I, I would like, when you talk about that courage, I'd like to normalize that across every interpersonal encounter. I think that we are unaware, largely unconscious, of what sort of courage, what sort of impact the other has on us, at least initially. Okay. I think there is a big bang, a collision of two people that occur every single time. Like, as I was walking here, I was about to step into the, into the, um, the bathroom, and uh, uh, you, the, no, no one can, can see, but there's a Dan Quigley on the end of this. Ah, Dan Quigley. And, and he's standing in the hall. So I have not seen... Dan Quigley in yes. a long time, but we are Facebook friends, so I do, right. I, I do, I do catch up on his life and what's going on with him okay. through that medium. And there was an encounter. Yeah, there is. Yes. So there, there's, and all I got to say is, oh, oh. <laughs> but, but, I don't know. But, <laughs> there's, there's things there you can't unsee. But so I haven't seen him in a while. So, but I am aware that as I see him for the first time, there is a, a, a there is a some micro moments of potential awkwardness. There, there's a certain right. collisions, but it usually occurs in the background. So as I come around the corner and see Quigley, he sees me. Both of us, uh, of us are experiencing things, at least unconsciously. There is a collision of sorts. Right. And we navigate that collision. Um, and, and keep in mind that meeting someone in the hallway is very different than sort of the context and the parameters that are afforded the therapist and the patient. Right. But boom, it happens. And right. I think there's a certain amount of courage necessary openness, the ability to be able to draw from both our past and what's happening in the present and an anticipated future to be able to navigate that. Right. So there are a lot of things going on that are probably not 
uh, we don't access in our consciousness. We do not. Uh, uh, very, very easily. But there's probably, we may feel some tension or mm. something that happens in that Fleeting tensions that we out of, and we have these sort of pre-programmed, reflexive ways in which we deal with this. In my end of the uh, spectrum, we, we call those um, introjects. We have, um, we pull from our past object relations to sort of guide us, and they reflexively guide us. So, in a strange way, when I see Quigley, yeah. um, can I call him Quigley? Is that you, can call him him Q, you can call him the Q, you can DQ, call him the Q, you can call him Daniel, you can call him Quigley. Quig? There was no joke about that. You can call me. Okay, so, so but <laughs> the, I have a, a he corresponds uh, in that initial impact to some, some inner variant. He calls up um, my, my past object relations with him. Okay. as well as a general template of, of interacting with others. Uh, in this case, he's, he's male, he's younger than I am, so uh, th there are all these sorts of things that move inside of me almost reflexively. And um, with some folks, say those who have a tremendous amount of social anxiety, okay. um, and uh, believe it or not, yes. through most of my life, up until... Uh, Late teenage, I was I was racked with social anxiety. Can't can't uh, believe any of that. It's true. Little, little, I was little, voted little, most right. shy in high school. Most shy was most that shy. a category? That was a category. It was a category. Okay. Most right. shy. Uh, that you high know, school needs to really take a look at that again. <laughs> that, that, but that was mo most shyest or most shy. Something like that. Whatever <laughs> it was, I, it was me. Okay. I remember I, I had right, they took a picture for the yearbook with me standing behind a tree. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little. Uh, that was you know. And they had me wear a trench coat, so was, I, maybe I that guess. was a different category. <laughs> maybe that was most most likely to end up on an FBI watch list. Did we lose our train of thought on that <laughs> okay. for a second, but yeah. Okay, so, okay. Yeah. But but so so but my my I think that those who have a tremendous amount of social anxiety are more acutely aware, and uh, I'm gonna have to quote Beyond on this. Okay, go ahead. That um, Beyond says that um, we have to be able to have. A, a contact barrier. We have to be able to actively repress certain things to be able to do the things we need to do. And I think part of what happens with folks with social anxiety, they are too acutely aware of that collision. All those tensions as opposed to being reflexively handled instead are, 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 are still in the forefront. They do not get backgrounded. They do not, right. they do not get repressed or moved into the foreground. They, they, are, um, they are assaulted by a way too present now. Right, a lot of a lot of information <clears throat> coming at a person, mm -hmm. uh, but somehow they're almost aware of it. It's uh, they over-incorporate mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. all of those kinds of things. I right? like that. I like that. And so, part of what you do when you train a new therapist is how to manage that. Um, we have a picture in the counseling center, and um, uh, if you walk into the file room, and it's a picture of a woman jumping up in the air, and she says, "I'm your new therapist. I have no idea what I'm doing." You know? Oh, interesting. And we have this picture. Very interesting. And the picture is there because it, th th there it, that's, in fact, we're about to start up. A whole new group of people. Some of uh, right. from the, the program here at CSU. Right. I think there are five folk from that program. Good. And uh, they have already spoken to, I don't know if I'm, I'm going to be able to do this. Right. I don't know. I, th this, this, is, this is scary. This is, you know, what, what's going to happen? What if and, I screw things up? Right, and these are interns, of course, mm -hmm. but just starting out in the practice. So, yeah, a lot of anxiety coming with that, uh, built into that process. But, but you were talking earlier about the anxiety for therapists, maybe even a seasoned therapist who's mm -hmm. done this, has mm -hmm. a great deal of experience. Well, see, the reason I, so. I brought up the picture of me behind the tree, not to uh, emphasize the fact that I could be on an FBI watch list, but I think part of why that this has been an area of interest and study for me for a while is because... I was, from the get-go, acutely aware of these things. And I think my, my interest in psychoanalytic theory actually is a result of that. Like, I was often aware of that there are things that people are aware of, but they don't seem to be aware of. And I was always aware of um, the texture and grain of any in, uh, interaction with another human being, often to a painful to degree, which often left me sort of just, I need to be quiet, and so I would listen. In fact, I remember in the first grade, second grade, yeah, first, second grade, a teacher says, is it easy to listen or to speak? And I never normally raise my hand, but I raised my hand and I said, well, I don't answer this, well, to listen. And she goes, oh, no, no, it's, it's harder. It's harder to listen than it is to speak. And I was like, whoa. And then it dawned on me, to, to her, and maybe to some of the people around me, that may actually be true. I, but the listening part, and so 
what do we need our, th our beginning therapist to do? To be able to be in a position to listen, to be open to an encounter with another human being, and to be on, and we, 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 we talked about this way back in the past, mm -hmm. to be able to have one foot on the bank and one foot in the water. So that we don't just ask them to survive, but to be aware of their own experience and their other experience. To, to use um, uh, 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 current uh, common parlance, they need to be woke, right? Okay. And they need, to be, they need to be woke in a way to experience uh, 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 awakened to themselves and to the other and to be able to maintain some balance in that. And that is a skill you've got to work on. It sounds like that's a very difficult skill, too, if I may uh -huh. say, that you have to monitor what's going on in you, your reaction, mm. sort of that barometer mm. of what's happening in the moment, uh, but also be very, very aware and listen. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, when in doubt, listen mm -hmm. in those early sessions. And the, the notion would be that I've really got to pay attention to the story of what this person is bringing, but I also have to manage and monitor and figure out what's what my reaction is, what's going on in that moment. That's a lot mm -hmm. to manage for the therapist. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes sense that they would bring a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. into that beginning moment. But the client's bringing anxiety as well. Mm -hmm. Is there going to be a fit? Is this person really a person that I can talk to, I can trust, mm -hmm. um, and tell what is really mm -hmm. going on with me? And, and, and obviously we have to have a safe environment for that mm -hmm. to happen. Well, I think in, in, in one way, what makes my encounter with, uh, with Mr. Quigley in the hallway very different than the, in, or similar but also very different than mm -hmm. what happens in the counseling session? We have strict parameters. There's a beginning and an end. It happens in an office. Uh, the roles are very clearly defined and delineated. We call that, um, in my end of the business, the frame. Yeah. So the frame allows for the sort of interpersonal encounter that you couldn't get anywhere else. It allows for a tremendous amount of intimacy without slipping into sex, without slipping into violence. Um, it, it generates a potential and your capacity to make use of that frame. And, and I think that's what helps the therapist to be able to balance this without it quite being as difficult as maybe as it sounds. Because really, the therapist has to be uh, present Mm -hmm. at a point in time that they're aware that they're needed to be present. When the, when the, when the session starts, right. they need to be there. And when it, they need to be able to end it. So that affords them a certain level of safety and it externalizes a lot of those skills in a way so it doesn't all fall on the therapist's shoulder. Yeah, right, otherwise it would be just overwhelming mm -hmm. and nothing would It'd be happen. like a date. It I mean, imagine, like literally, date. imagine what a date's like. Okay. Because there are no parameters. <laughs> You're, you're sitting across, you know, you're, you're at the, uh, but what people, what people go to dates around, they go to that, um, they go to that, um, what is that, that smoke and bones. What's that place people go to all the time? Smokies? What's S Smoky bones? Something like something. They go, they go someplace and they got, they, okay, they have. That's a restaurant. It's I, a restaurant. I don't know yeah. if I'm, I'm getting this, but yes. <laughs> okay, maybe it's a, okay. so they're there. They're, they're, they're surrounded by people who may not, or may or may not be scrutinizing them. They're being scrutinized by the person sitting across from them. Right. They are also their own inner scrutiny. Yes. So that, that there's, um, um, there's a, a philosopher named Foucault who calls, calls it the pantopticon. Pantopticon, I think Okay, call. you're going to have to explain that. It just means that, you know, it's like that's how prisons are set up. So that wherever you are, you can be seen from every angle. Uh, so you're yes. always under observation. And that there's this, this pantop, panopticon paranoia. So at that moment, you are being scrutinized both inside and outside. All eyes right? on you. All yeah, eyes, yeah. even if they're not. Yeah. The first date is, is a wonderful example of a very, uh, of um, uh, the, the, the perfect collision of subjectivities. Boom, pow, right. you hit, right? Yes, uh, and a lot of anxiety that comes with that, but it, you said mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, in your term that all eyes are on the person mm -hmm. or the couple in that dating mm -hmm. situation, mm -hmm. but it may be the same in therapy as well. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of expectations. Oh, well, the beginning therapist, they have their supervisor, sometimes supervisors right. breathing down their neck. Yes. They have the expectation of the, uh, the, uh, the, the patient. Right. And so and that, their own expectations right. as well. So there, th there is a there. panopticon moment there. However, it, th th they also have, um, they have their, the potential support of their therapist or their supervisor. And they have the potential support of the frame. That's part of what we, we, we help them deal with. Right, right. You know, uh, one of the first things I say to a beginning therapist is, you know, um, actually, my first thing is to get them to, um, to call for 
or call up their uh, the necessary interject. And, and I have them say, and I always say to them uh, that you have done therapy before. There have been many times in your life when someone has approached you in pain or discomfort, and in talking with you, they felt better. That's part of why you're here, and you've chosen this profession. Sure. So I want them to pull for what they already know. They already have a, a set of, of intrajects and interactions with others that they can, they can be able to pull from, and it helps to destabilize. That's often the first step in, uh, that, I, that I do in any sort of supervision or any sort of seminar space with beginning therapists. Be yeah. who you are in that moment. And I think that allows for the capacity to be, to be silent and present, to be able to potential to begin to lean in. All those things are potentiated by that initial connection with, with who they are and where they've been and what they've already cultivated. Wow, I think that's, uh, that's, a, that's a great point. It, you want to really bring the best of who you are into that moment so you're available yeah. in your presence as you said you're yeah. present with that yeah. that client because there's a lot of anxiety on the client's part so um, the therapist has to manage that situation manage themselves kind of be in touch uh, be present you said have one foot on the bank one foot in the stream can you talk a little bit more about that yeah. in terms of the beginning therapist when they first start that it sounds like it's a difficult balance I've really got to be with the client but I've got to monitor my reaction so that it gives me some mm. route and, and some plan, some path to, uh, to help me. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to normalize it a little and say that, again, any successful inter interpersonal encounter has at least an element of that, that you, you are aware of the other and as well as yourself in a way that allows you to be present and uh, that that's what makes any sort of satisfying interpersonal encounter, whether it be at first date or quickly in the hall. That was it wasn't our first date, but we, we've hung out before. So any inter satisfying interpersonal encounter has to be able to navigate that. I think that um, with the beginning therapist, there's a point at which, and it's really in some ways, this may be something we want to talk about later on, but okay. the therapist at some point, particularly even if, even if you work from a more directive, like cognitive behavioral sort of treatment, you still have to make use of yourself. You are a walking assessment tool. You are, you have a capacity to be able to know what's going on in the other by finding them in yourself. And that can often be at that, and that's not just a tool for assessment, but that's also one of the things that helps to heal. When, um, when a patient can see an echo of themselves or reflection of themselves in you, it helps them to be able to own parts of themselves too. So there's, there's a real important part of, of allowing yourself to find the person in you. And I'm Sort of thinking of mm -hmm. examples of that that have that have that have happened uh, when in my supervision, like um, um, I, I think I made an example before, but I was supervising a person and um, um, their their uh, their their patient, uh, the, fi the uh, therapist is female. The patient begins saying all these horrible things about women. Very misogynistic statements. Right. You know, right. Think, we talked about yeah, that in talked the about, session. Yeah. And I'm thinking that, and uh, I'll use I'll use some of the phrases because I think they're important. All women are whores. That's what he kept saying over and over again. He kept talking about, you know, all they want is money, and they'll leave you for another guy who has more money. Or wow. That's all this. He's going on about this, it. right? Yeah, He's going. Yeah. So the, 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 the woman in the session, the, the, the female therapist, she begins to feel, uh, well, a sense of, of anger and outrage. It begins to... to Being know, attacked. She and feels attacked and whatnot. But if, if she can allow herself to feel that, and cultivate just the right amount of distance from that experience to allow that collision to happen, to allow the words to enter her ears and to hit her, to move in her nervous system, but also cultivate that capacity and that standing on, on, the, on the bank, right. but also her foot is in the water. As she's, she can ask herself, why am I feeling this? What does it say about the person across from me? What might be they, what, what, what might they be experiencing? And it allows the potential then to lean into them, and so it generates. But you have to first survive that. You have to be, and you, and there are two ways to not survive it. The most obvious way would be to get angry back and say, you sure, know, that's U.S.O.B. A quick, and quick whatnot. Response, but for yeah. therapists, another way to be able to lose it is to not feel anything at all. Okay. I mean, and you can move to a place of of cold and calculated judgment. This is a narcissistic personality disorder. And that's another way to lose the person. If you can stay in between, you can find the heartbeat in that. You can be able to say, 
why would, oh, I think I know why. This person is telling me underneath all this anger how many times he's been rejected and hurt, and he is in the presence of another female. This is the f he is staring at me, and whether unconsciously, what is moving in him is all, all those old hurts, all those old object relations, those interjects are being stirred like a swarm of bees, and he's unaware of it, and is, and, and, but it's coming out in his, in his words, and I need to be able to hear it for him to find a way to be able to give it back to him, either directly by telling him, right now, you are with me and I'm a woman, and women have hurt you in the past. Or, mm -hmm. if he's unable to hear that, because some people couldn't in the right, midst of right. anger, to be able to find a place of calm and bear witness to his feelings and simply reflect and clarify so I can get him to a space where he might be able to own that. Does that make and sense? Then, yes, it does, and mm -hmm. then it opens up that conversation. It opens, mm -hmm. Actually, it sounds like the beginning of therapy at mm -hmm. that point, too. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things I took away from that. One, one is that there's this shift from the stream to the bank, mm -hmm. if you will. I'm mm -hmm. always kind of interested in mm -hmm. how, the, how much the therapist stays in the moment with the client, listen to the story, and how much are they mm -hmm. kind of pulling back and observing at a, mm -hmm. at a distance uh, and reflecting on how they're feeling and what's going on with them. And that sounds like a shift that has mm -hmm. to take place um, a lot mm -hmm. for, for the therapist to, uh, to move and maneuver in and out. And, and I think you know, part of the reason I brought up that story of, of, of me and uh, the second grade teacher is that I think some of us, uh, there, is, there is a curse from social anxiety. But part of the gift is you may already find it easy to stay on the bank. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you already may have, have developed a way to, so I, my, there's a running joke in my family with, um, my nephew was talking about this the other day, that if someone's talking to me in the middle of a conversation, I will stop what I'm saying and just sort of stare into space. And they're like, what, what is that? Mm -hmm. well, what it is is I'm often so much on the bank that if someone's talking to me, I, I'll, 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 I'll just start looking at the kaleidoscope of my own inner experience and I'm no longer interacting. I'm like, <laughs> wow, look at what's stirring in me. It's like I suddenly am no longer looking at the end. I'm looking like, this is really interesting. Look at, all, go? <laughs> look at all this interesting stuff. And they're like, over here. Oh, Come yeah, back over yeah, here. We're, right. over, we're yeah. over. Well, yeah, I, I think you have to build a skill, a, a mm. skill set around that so that you can kind of move in and be the client. The client's certainly looking mm. for you for some guidance and, and support uh, and challenge. We've talked about support and challenge being another uh, job uh, of the therapist. But back to the very beginning, aren't we trying to build um, a trusting relationship? Aren't we, uh, as therapists, want to that first idea of being perceived as trustworthy? Mm -hmm. So there's a, we haven't talked about trust that much. Mm -hmm. So w w what, uh, what about that from well, this it's, perspective? It's ironic because with, with the individual who's telling the, um, the therapist that all women are whores, I think in some ways he already begins to experience her as someone he can trust, and that makes him her even scarier. When he said those vicious things, hurtful yeah. things, that was also another way to look at that yeah, was he's there trying, was a connection there. He's trying to distance. He's saying, uh-oh, you seem kind, you seem loving, you seem like someone who I could trust. Oh, no, I could really be hurt again. So there is a danger in trust. And I think that's, you know, so when you say building that, I think we often think about how, well, the therapist needs to be present and needs to generate this space, but also be aware that by doing that, you are also stirring the inner hornet's nest of the person across from you, particularly if they have a narcissistic personality organization, or if they have any sort of personality disorder. The mere fact that you are trusting and trustworthy is a dangerous, dangerous thing. So well, that doesn't really answer your question in terms of no, building trust, no, but I think it's, it's one way to think about, like, you know, uh, particularly if you're going to work with, with folks who are, uh, who are struggling with personality disorder issues, part of what makes it so freaky is that they, they, they say and do things that seem to not make sense, but when you can contextualize it, when you can see how it is co-constructed and find themselves in you, lean in, it all makes sense. Then it becomes clear mm. for the therapist and what they need to do at mm -hmm. that moment. It almost provides uh, that plan I was mentioning, that guide, guideline, uh, and, and the questions that they may ask mm -hmm. of, the, of the client. Mm -hmm. So at the very beginning part of, of therapy, it seems to me that the, the therapists themselves really have to be self-aware and work on that and work on being on the bank in, in the stream and sometimes mm -hmm. when you catch yourself, like you were saying, a little mm -hmm. too much on the bank. So one of the things that you said last week is that uh, on, on uh, Got Therapy, 
right here on iTunes, um, was that we don't control our feelings. Mm. So it's just a, it's it, what you just said was maybe the the beginning therapist should really yeah. tune into the feelings yeah. that they have. Yeah, and, and, and one one of the ways you know my, one of my favorite um, Dylan quotes quote of all time I fought with my twin that enemy within until both of us fell by the way. What happens is if you begin to wrestle with the things that you feel, then you lose. And so the beginning therapist says, and, and um, I'm not a huge fan of um, I think it's Albert Ellis, right? But yes. one of the things he said, he's talked to you, you shouldn't should on yourself. Don't should on yourself. And at that moment, if you say, I shouldn't feel this, right. you've already, you, you've tied yourself up. You, 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 even if you win, you lose. And so a beginning therapist, if you can, try to be able to be as, as in contact with that anxiety as much as you can, to be able to give it a name and to honor it, and then to be able to, to be mindful, maybe even do something with it. Okay. All right, but let's sh let's shift this mm -hmm. just a little bit and talk about the client's mm -hmm. responsibilities, if you will, and in that same way. To have would good you, insurance. Would you uh, <laughs> good insurance and or cash pay? <laughs> That's right. However, um, would you say the same things apply to the client that we've been talking about thus far? Uh, this notion of being mindful and being um, sort of foot on the bank, foot in mm -hmm. the stream themselves, or the client may not be in that space. What, what do you think about well, from the client's perspective yeah. as they come into therapy? I, I think that in some ways um, it is beneficial for the patient not to be in that space. Uh, if if um, one, one of the, uh, the goals... Maybe all stream, if right. you will, in that, in that analogy. If, if you create the right sort of space, then a patient can be free to be lots of things. That, that they can allow themselves to, to express the, the racist things they feel the anger, the rage, um, uh, the dark things. Um, we had a, uh, I was supervising someone a couple of weeks ago and um, their patient came in and, and they prefaced saying, well, you know, I really shouldn't think this about my mom, but, you know. And, and in some ways that's a sign of you created the right sort of space. You've also created a space where you might be able to say to the patient, well, I noticed that you've had to correct yourself. That of itself is an important thing. But if you create the right space, the patient can, can be lost in front of you in a way that you can help them to be found. And um, I, I think we'd be asking the wrong things. And, and it's funny because, you know, certain personality organizations, folks who have uh, an obsessive compulsive personality style or obsessive style often hold on to control. And right. part of the work of therapy is to get them to let it go, right. you know. And with other folk, um, um, you have folks who come in and uh, they are all over the place. And yeah, when we develop control, may be more important. And that's where, it, in some ways, it's contextualized, and some level of assessment needs to happen to be able to determine what your 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 um, uh, future expectation of the patient might be, and how to be able to determine if treatment is working. Because right. you know, you wouldn't important. necessarily want the obsessive. You might. You wouldn't want them to be more rigid, and you wouldn't want right. the neurotic or the or the hysteric to be more uh, to be more fluid than they already are. Okay, okay, so um, having said that, let's jump at the end of that first session. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about the beginning of therapy, but mm -hmm. let's move now to walking away uh, from that first session from the therapist's point of view, from the client's point of view. Um, what do you want to have happened during that time if you've mm -hmm. felt like you've had a successful first encounter, first mm -hmm. session? Um, what's a therapist thinking about? What do well, they want to have happened? I, I let um, beginning therapists often make the assumption that that first session the patient should be cured. Let that ham, <laughs> <laughs> right? So the first session is you know, you know they're uh, they stop drinking, or right, uh, you right. know they're, is wonderful they're no you know, like, yeah. and that that's you know and and not that that couldn't possibly happen, but uh, that really doesn't happen. Right. So. I set the bar really low. I think if nothing else, and, and at, at its lowest, to have survived, that you have survived the patient, and that you can step away from that encounter, that you at least have something to think about for yourself and to bring into supervision. So I set it at simple survival, mm -hmm. to not be, um, to be too overwhelmed and to shame or attack the patient, or to move to a space where you are so cold and calculated that you only see them as a diagnosis. If a beginning therapist comes to me and says, man, I got this horrible borderline patient I just saw, 
I'm thinking they may not have quite survived in a way that they right. may need to. Um, so I would set the bar there. Now there are other things to be able to have had the potential for to do a trial intervention of some for sort. Right. Um, I have a lot of folks. Uh, the uh, you know the, the current sort of dominant paradigm is a more directed paradigm where mm -hmm. you have to be able to work from a cognitive behavioral frame. So they say, well, I need to get some homework for the first. Well, right, right. unfortunately, you're going to see patients who are not cognitive behavioral therapy patients, and right. either you refer them or you're going to have to develop a way to be adaptive. And just like I see folks who are not psychoanalytic patients, and I have to be able to adapt to them and keep them on my caseload. So survive, maybe a trial intervention of some sort to determine exactly what sort of therapy you need to craft. Those are at least the two things. And the third, I might add any sure. sort of affective movement. If the patient is able to feel in front of you, then that allows that, that you're, you've created the right sort of frame, you're building the right sort of relationship. Um, there's a troubling trend that I see with some of the folks that I work with where that they're supposed to uh, at the beginning of each session hand out these things that the patient is supposed to rate themselves and the therapist so oh, yeah. every every session gets rated and uh, I can see <laughs> how that uh, I mean I can see how it might be useful for in some ways <laughs> but it generates a re it really sets a different sort of tone and often requires you know it eats away at the first 15, 20 minutes of any session because you have to recover from this right. forced assessment. That, that's so, right. that, that's so right. but uh, th th those trend, are my thoughts. Though. You're right. You're right about that. Mm. Customer satisfaction surveys. Yeah. Or, you know how how are we mm. doing? Sort of the organizational mm -hmm. management side of that, but uh, that deflects away mm -hmm. from what you need to be in that moment with with the client. Well, that's that's uh, that's a very interesting notion. So you also said something about the the um, the therapist sort of then going to supervision. So mm -hmm. they must uh, sort of r really try to understand both what the client presented, what happened in them, and then come into supervision so they can talk with the supervisor about mm -hmm. that and make some sense, get some information, and, mm -hmm. uh, and prepare for the next. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe this, because I know we talked about making this uh, two-parter, three-parter, maybe a 15-parter. Maybe. It'd be like Game of Thrones. Yeah, it could be, but, uh, if we were only so like, lucky. More yes. like the Harry Potter, except there'll be much less nudity. Yes, Harry there's Potter still. Well, no, 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 there's not nudity to Harry Potter, no, right. Game of Thrones. I don't think there's... Okay, yeah, you get yeah, those confused, yes. There's no, uh, it's not, but... Um, it's a series to start. Yeah. This is the first one. We got I'm that I'm not going to make We're any wand jokes. We're going to get this jokes. one done, then we'll see. But, uh, All right. but, well, uh, I, I don't think of. that's going to be happening, <laughs> the, the no, not, not making any more jokes, but we'll but carry on. I think that, you know, maybe the thing to think about is 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 if the idea of of in the sessions to come, how the... A therapist can can make use of what what they uh, when they find the patient in themselves that part of what needs to happen in the therapist's mind is to make use of the information that they're receiving filtered through their own self and their own experience and I think that's something to think about maybe that's something to talk about next time sure how to be able to uh, and there's a there Beyond on again uh, Beyond yeah. talks about the selected fact and of all mm. the information that's flowing in the room uh, the supervisee brings to me Sim selected facts and um, I often talk to them about developing a clinical ear how to know what to listen for and to be open for the things even the weird things that seem to catch your inner ear mm -hmm. um, and that may be something to, to talk about yeah talk I'd love about to next talk time about then. that because I think we're both in the uh, supervision uh, game if you will that we're mm -hmm. supervising uh, beginning therapists mm -hmm. so we're going to try to I find Talk shame also more. is a very uh, shame, shame is very, uh, and um, that should drive a supervision session. You I'm know, not, I'm not going to go with that. <laughs> uh, but okay, so we we just kind of covered this um, the beginning of therapy, but also it seems like that. And I was asking about the at the end of therapy and how you want to walk away and what's happened with that. But you also have to prepare the the client for the work ahead. You have to instill some hope, as, mm -hmm. as, and, but also kind of preparing them to do their own work in the mm -hmm. coming sessions. Yeah, there's a term, you have to give them a little bang for their buck. Mm -hmm. There has to be something, you know, you, I like the way you talk about hope because, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, often folks come to us in a state of, um, of uh, despair. Um, sure. There is a hopelessness. Uh, again, that's, that's, a, that's an important concept too. Well, I've, I've appreciated talking about this. This, this may be a series. We'll see. We'll this, see, is see. A, this is the start yeah. of it right here. We want to thank you for tuning in uh, to Got Therapy 2016. I'm not sure, but yeah, we'll say it out loud. 
So this Live can the ham. Uh, I'm going to forget about that. This is Dr. Dan Rose. I'm Michael Balkan. We're glad you could join us today. Watch us again uh, right here at Dr. Therapy. We'll see you next time.